I grew up in the Napa Valley. Uh, my family's been there though since the 1860s, and uh, they immigrated from Alsace and moved into Napa Valley, started growing grapes, eventually started making wine. They got shut down by prohibition like many others in California, and uh, they didn't get back into the industry until 1972. In the meantime, they grew prunes, walnuts, did do some uh, grapevine growing. They sold the fruit up uh, the road in, in Rutherford to Inglenook and Bull U Vineyards. So it was in the late 60s when uh, they weren't making ends meet and my grandfather decided that they'd either start in the commercial wine business, put their grapes to better use and convert the farm from prunes and walnuts over to grapes. And uh, if not, they would move to Australia and, uh, and, and get a farm there and start farming exactly what they were doing in California. They asked my father, who at the time was 19, if he would join them and he said yeah. They jumped into it, and in 1972, they created their first vintage of Camus Vineyards. Shortly after that, realized that Cabernet was king for Napa Valley. And along with, I think, the, the consumer awareness in, in America and understanding fine wine, Camus, along with Napa Valley, grew, and the style of Napa Valley along with that, which today is that you know lush, rich, uh, very opulent style of Cabernet that we're known for. I got involved in 2001 and started playing around with uh, Pinot Noir, and it was just uh, being done in the corner of one of the buildings at the winery. I uh, did everything, you know, hand punched down in a, in a little um, half ton bin and Pinot Noir wasn't a hot item. It wasn't something people were looking for. It was something that um, had a world renowned character to it. But when people wanted Pinot, they were going to Burgundy and they knew exactly what they wanted and they were going to pay the price for it. So we were kind of venturing into uncharted waters. It was something I believed in. It was a variety that I really enjoyed. It was the first vineyard I ever planted in 97, uh, was a Pinot vineyard on the far Sonoma coast. So I had this emotional tie to it. And so we started playing around with ideas on how we could better capture the hearts and minds of consumers throughout um, America and get them acquainted with California Pinot Noir for just how special it was. It wasn't Burgundy. We weren't trying to be Burgundy. I wanted the, to venture off that path and create a style of Pinot Noir that, that resonated with me and the, the characters that Mother Nature gave us, which was a richer, riper style of Pinot. The family dynamics in the wine business can be very difficult, and oftentimes you see empires fall because of infighting. What my family did was a very different, non-traditional route of family business. My dad gave me an opportunity, and he gave me an opportunity of just getting involved in the wine business and helping support me. In my case, it was Pinot Noir, uh, and gave me great guidance, great education in how to make wine, how to grow grapes, and that was the foundation of it. I think I proved myself in being able to uh, effectively make a good, solid wine and bring it to market, um, and worked into the family business that way. Seeing how the, the growth of the category has progressed, I mean, obviously Sideways was a major part of that. I think that when we started making the wines in the style we're making them today, um, that's what resonated with consumers. That's what people liked. And it was a reflection of the areas where we're growing. California's got heat summation. It's got you know great and abundant sunlight. So you get ripeness and kind of amplified characters, um, but still soft and weighty, good acidity. And, and these coastlands are just perfect for it. Back in our first days of Bell Gloss, every single fermentation lot and every single barrel was an experiment. We learned a lot through those days. I feel like I ruined a lot of wine. Um, racked up a pretty darn good debt uh, to the point where um, you know the, our, our accountant looked at it and said, I, I don't think you're gonna get out of this hole. Well, then sideways hit and the world changed for Pinot Noir. You know, it was a great learning experience. We got to experiment a lot and that's really where our, our style today came from. Uh, of course, we tried to take the Burgundian approach. It just didn't work. It wasn't the style of wine that I thought best reflected the California coast. Um, and much like up here in Oregon now, we're taking that same philosophy. We did a lot of experimentation back in 2011, 2012, learned a lot about each of these individual areas um, throughout Willamette Valley, Umpqua Valley, Rogue Valley, and how they all need to be catered to differently from both a, a management and the vineyard standpoint and also a fermentation standpoint. I feel like we're letting the fruit tell us what it wants to be. We're just taking cues during fermentation uh, to make sure we coax out those characters. We started with Bell Gloss in 2001, had one vineyard designate. By 2002, the writing was on the wall. It was about vineyard expression and it became vineyard designation focused. But I also saw that there was a missing link to getting people in America to enjoy California Pinot Noir, table side and enjoying it with great food. And at the price points we were at with Bell Gloss, it wasn't an everyday go-to. So the concept of Mayomi came up, and that was multiple sites throughout coastal regions. And so we ran with that, and the pricing was such that we could kind of work it into a, a very uh, uh, low price point, very accessible, um, especially for by the glass. And that's where we focused our efforts with Mayomi. Um, it really assisted in, in getting 
American consumers excited about Pinot Noir, but also garnered a lot of attention for Belle Gloss in general, and that became kind of the upsell in a way. If you want to look at it as a halo brand effect, um, but also having the support of something that had a, a broader um, base and a broader ability to grow, uh, that's where, where I think the strength of this kind of this unique um, halo and, and lower tier uh, effect came from. Growing Mayomi was a very exciting time. Uh, it took a lot of work, a lot of effort. Um, it was predominantly sourced fruit, so we purchased from growers throughout the state. We were doubling production for three to four years in a row. Um, and being able to, to grow to that magnitude every year, you know, if you're going from five to 10 to 20 to 40, maybe not a big deal. If you're going from 100 to 200 to 400, it's a whole different world. And it takes a heck of a lot of capital. To be able to grow to that degree, with the financial constraints that, that most businesses have, um, that is absolutely the, the, uh, the, one of the most difficult hurdles to overcome in the wine business. It's a capital intensive business. You're not seeing a return for a long period of time. The one thing that was unique with Mayomi was that Pinot Noir by and large, it only needs about nine months, maybe 12 max on oak, unless you're making a different style. But you can get a pretty quick turnaround for a, a high dollar wine. Um, and that really assisted in our growth at the same time, along with any data we could get to talk to our banks. So whether it was uh, uh, syndicated data like IRI or Nielsen, we could show that to our banks and say, hey, this is the tra trajectory we're on. We need some more support with this brand. We're looking at growing it to X this year. Um, and so that's going to be a, an additional, you know, however many dollars in, in, um, in our line of credit. We'd flex all the way up into that line of credit, and then we'd pay it all down. It was just, you know, a lot of cash in, a lot of cash out. A lot of people don't have the space or capacity to grow to that degree. We started hopping all over to different facilities, and I'll tell you that that may, may have been the biggest and most difficult uh, um, issue we had with Mayomi, was working in multiple facilities, trying to control all the fermentations, all the fruit supply, um, and then trying to get it all into one location for blending. And that, to me, was the, the fundamental difference between commodity wine and fine wine. We blended one single blend at the end of at the end of our aging cycle, and we bottled it. We may not have bottled it, you know, from front to back. We may have had some breaks in the middle to bottle other products. But being able to have one singular blend was a huge part in keeping it a fine wine uh, focus. On premise was a major focus for us, and still is for me. We maintained a major focus in the restaurant side of, of the world, so we were about 60% on premise, which is huge considering the success that that brand had in retail. It is what I consider our route to market and bypassing all the gatekeepers. If we have good pricing and a good quality product, you just got to get a few accounts here and there, and all of a sudden it starts to bubble up. Um, once you can prove that it's had success on premise, then it can continue to grow outward. And retail is kind of the you know the last uh, straw to growing a brand. But when it came to the restaurant side of the business, if we were able to get this wine into somebody's mouth at a you know great experience restaurant, you have a white tablecloth, great food, great service, great company. The only thing that you can increase there is is adding wine. And if we could add a great quality wine for a good price, we'd be able to you know support um, that brand in growing. That's why, why I think it was so important. We weren't looking for scores. We weren't looking for uh, buy-in from sommeliers. I was looking for what a, con a consumer in America wanted to drink. And I felt it's what I wanted to drink when I was sitting down at a table and felt that that's, uh, that's what we were trying to provide and I feel that's what we did provide. But I think overall, being able to have that level of quality and character in your wines that people want to drink, that's, that's key, that is fundamental. You miss that, you're not gonna be able to grow your brand. Ramping Mayomi up to the degree we did took a lot of distribution management. We treat each state as an independent uh, um, distributor though, so we don't really you know, manage from a global perspective where you may have a southern house in one state that's doing much better than a southern house in another. Um, but having, having that relationship um, from a, a more uh, a global level really does assist in, in some of the communication, especially when it comes to marketing, having everybody on the same page. But managing at a state level is, I think, what, what it really comes down to. Being more granular, I guess you could say, in how you're operating in each individual market. And oddly enough, um, Mayomi really thrived in the south. Uh, Florida, Tennessee was our most uh, overperforming market, South Carolina. Um, just states that you wouldn't necessarily imagine, uh, you know, moving the needle to the degree that they did. Texas to this day is um, one of our, our greatest states, um, still growing at a huge clip, and um, just seems like there's an insatiable thirst for Pinot Noir. Um, and oddly enough, California and New York are two of our most difficult markets, still to this day, and they were two of the most difficult with Mayomi. 
uh, working, you know, working against, um, I think, what the chain business does here in California um, was uh, was very difficult. There's a lot of money being thrown in the chains, a lot of big guys that, that have, you know, pretty deep pockets in the marketing. And so we would hit a wall at some point. Um, and so it was difficult to really penetrate as deep as we wanted. One of the challenges with, with the business, every state is different, but that's also the beauty of it. So you find little pockets of where you find success and then you expand upon that. DTC is always a nice element of business from a financial standpoint, but I look at it more as a marketing uh, piece to the business. You're not gonna have a brand to the level of success that you would with Mayomi without working with the three-tier system. We're fortunate to have these great relationships with our, our distributor partners, and we wanna continue those going forward, and, and that's really our foundation of opportunity when it comes to growth. Um, nobody can do the deliveries, nobody can consolidate as, as they do. It's a whole different business model. Um, yeah, could there be more business in DTC uh, from the wine business as a whole? Absolutely. But again, you're not going to get to that scale without the three tier. There came a point with Mayomi where we hit a ceiling. We had to make a decision. We were either going to be in this for the long haul and we had to increase our infrastructure and really you know, double down on everything. The simple way to describe it would be our blending tanks. Our last blend that we put together for Mayomi Pinot Noir was about 2.2 million gallons in one homogenous blend. Um, largest blend we've ever done, and it was a massive undertaking on one site and then, and then bottled it. We were looking at putting in half million gallon tanks so that we could effectively blend as you know, the, the vintages went on. The other option was that we sell the brand to a buyer that was looking and had been kind of hounding us for this brand. Yeah, do I love growing a brand? It's a heck of a lot of fun. But, uh, but, you know, I think there's a level that you get to with a brand where, you know, it becomes just this monster and you're just continually feeding the beast. So the phone rings one day and it's a good friend of mine in the wine business. And, uh, and he tells me he had, he had sold a brand about a year or two years prior. And he tells me uh, the guy that brokered his deal wants to talk. And he just said, it's just a beer, nothing else. Well, um, you know, I said, yeah, sure, let's do it. So we, we met in Yachtville and had a beer together, all three of us. And, uh, and my friend leaves, and so I'm left with this uh, M&A guy. And great guy. Um, we chatted for a while, and he, he told me what he was up to. And he was uh, representing Constellation. And they had uh, seen Mayomi come up as a, an opportunity as an acquisition. And um, immediately the answer was no. And we had continued talking for a while over you know, a period of six months and you know, just kind of became friends. And the answer was always no. The reason for that was that you know, I was having a blast building this brand. I felt that it was a huge opportunity going forward. And it was still, in a way, in its infancy. It was still a discovery brand. Many people didn't hear, hadn't heard about it yet. Finally, about two years down the road or so, we start talking about kind of how the whole thing works. And you know, you have the multiple against EBITDA and whatever else. And I said, I said all right, we'll, we'll let you see some basics on, on our, our financials. So he took a look at it, and all of a sudden this number came out. And it wasn't the number that we ended up getting. It was much lower than that, because we said no again. So, so, so all of a sudden we're sitting here, we're, we're thinking, okay, this, this brand is obviously something special out there. And uh, you know, to me it was just, we were just building a, a brand. We weren't you know, trying to set the world on fire, but fortunately we did. We continued growing it, and the, uh, the earnings continued to rise. And uh, the multiple stayed the same, and we ended up um, moving through the process. It was about a four or five month process, and uh, and you know the the uh, say the dollar figure was um, much higher than I would have ever expected. It was something we couldn't say no to. Eventually, it became clear that the buyer was Constellation, and they had more of a mechanism for how to come up with a multiple. And uh, the reason for a lot of their, their financial decisions are based more on the fact that they're a publicly traded company. They need to justify an acquisition, which I completely understood. So we settled on a multiple, um, and then it was just a function of inventory and EBITDA. And uh, it was as simple as that. I felt that the mechanism we came up with was a fair and equi equitable deal for both of us. Um, and it made all the sense in the world. And I still felt like we were getting um, a very, a very uh, good deal. So we went forward with that, regardless of what the EBITDA was on the closing date. Um, we decided that, uh, that that was the mechanism and we'd, we'd move on from there. Could we take the brand to where Constellation brought it? Absolutely not in the time that they've done it. And that's when these large guys, they're more uh, equipped to do these things. That's what, what made sense to me. When Constellation assessed our business, I think they knew there was a whole lot of room left to grow. Uh, again, we had never worked in the club channels. Um, that was low-hanging fruit, and that's huge volume. 
Uh, they had also uh, looked at you know kind of the the next layer down of distribution, whether it be 7-Elevens or or any sort of mini marts. I mean, there was a whole lot of opportunity out there, and so I, I think that they saw that and they saw the value there. And when they jumped into it, obviously they had a huge increase. We had also stayed very stable on our price points. Our retail minimums um, are something that I hold sacred. I know it sounds odd, but when you allow discounters to bring your retails down below your minimum uh, acceptable price, then you're going to be damaging the integrity of your brand. And they saw that as more price elasticity. You take it from $19.99 down to $17.99 down to $15.99, you're going to increase your volumes by X degree in whatever month you want to. So um, I understand that business model. I understand why they do it. It's just not the way that we operate. And so I think it was a very appetizing uh, brand acquisition for them. And yeah, it broke the mold of what was normal. But now you see that being the standard. You're taking a brand that's flying, but still having some opportunity to grow more in the luxury category because people don't want to play with those lower tier elements in the marketplace. So when we first sat down with Constellation about this deal, the number one thing on my mind was a non-compete. And if we, if we had a non-compete or a heavily binding non-compete, it was a no-go. So that was the first deal point to get through. Uh, we got through that. Um, I felt that what we came up with was you know, a bit of a push on their side, a little bit of a push on our side. Um, but at the end of the day, I understand they don't want to be funding their competition. Um, so we had a few carve-outs there. We still had some opportunity to continue growing. The first thing I said to them was, I'm, I'm not stopping my Pinot Noir production, and I'm going to continue growing. And, and they completely understood it. It was just a matter of getting some guardrails on it. So again, I think they could justify it to their shareholders as, you know, this is a good deal. It's not going to, you know, just hit the limelight for a couple months and then all of a sudden fall off and then here comes Joe Wagner with the next Mayomi. So what did they buy? Well, they bought the intellectual property, the, the trademark of the name Mayomi. Uh, they bought the inventory both in bulk and also uh, in bottle. And then uh, they purchased um, the uh, the grape contracts, or a good portion of the grape contracts, I should say. Post Mayomi sale, Constellation wanted to consolidate Mayomi into its distribution platform throughout the nation. Some states, of course, are franchise states, so uh, I think that was a little more of a difficult task. But most other states give notification and they make the change. So were there some winners and some losers? Absolutely. I'll say that that was part of the deal. That was something that we had looked at uh, early on and uh, figured out who those who those losers of the brand may be and how we could fairly compensate them going forward. And a lot of that was based on deals we put together to grow our new brands, but almost like a, you know, an assisted funding of growing the new brands and replacing that business. And so overall, it worked out well. We've maintained more or less the same uh, distributors that we have in every state as we did with Mayomi. We've had a few changes, of course, over time, but overall, um, it's the same and those relationships are still golden. In regards to the power of the land uh, versus the power of the brand, um, it is in my heart and soul to believe that the power of the land overtakes the power of the brand. You can build a brand anywhere at any time, you know, given that you, you do everything right, but you can't replace land. Um, if you wanna if you wanna maintain um, the longevity of a product or longevity of a of a family business such as ours, you gotta start with the ground. I think that's also a, a different mentality than most publicly traded companies would have. They don't want hard assets. They they want brands. They want things that are just going to continue driving you know more money. Um, for me, it's it's more of the long term. It's more of making sure that we can sustain the growth of our business and continue to grow more grapes um, to sustain those brands over the long long term. So yeah, Mayomi was purely a brand deal. There was not a high demand of my time from Constellation. They did retain me for 10 hours per month. I might say we did a total of 10 to 15 hours of work, most of that being on the first few months of kind of onboarding. So whether it was being out in the vineyard and discussing grape maturity in comparison to what the standard is, how I viewed a vineyard versus how, say, the norm of viewing a vineyard is, uh, some of the blending aspects and how we operate some of our, our use of barrels and, and oak. Those were some of the elements that they, they wanted to dig into a little bit deeper. When you're dealing with a, a large company, they have a different way of doing things. They typically have vendors that they work with, and a lot of the vendors we work with may have not been approved, so to speak. Um, and so, so that's something that, you know, quickly changed and, you know, I'd say within the first six months, there was very little communication, um, which was fine with me, but they had taken the brand and decided we're running this way. 
and they've done a phenomenal job of running with it. So after we sold Maomi, we had a, a good amount of, of cash on hand. We had launched uh, a handful of brands uh, during that time, and Maomi was a great foot in the door. Um, gave us an opportunity to get into the market a little bit faster and kind of you know use that, that strength and weight of the brand uh, to get some new wines onto the shelves or on a wine list, etc. I'd say we more or less stayed the course of what we were planning to do. Um, we just had more of a capital infusion. We no longer had to work with the banks to the degree we were working with them, and we were able to to, uh, to create these brands and you know uh, bring them to market. I think in a much more old-fashioned sense. About a year and a half prior to selling Maomi, we created Copper Cane as a vehicle to take that style of winemaking and that style of of going to market um, to a broader degree. So uh, Copper Cane first launched with Elowan Pinot Noir from Oregon, Baron Zinfandel from California, Carne Humana Red Blend out of Napa Valley, and uh, we had a few new concepts we were going to be coming out with over the next few years. Well, the Maomi deal happened. We continued to stay course on what our plans were, so no major change. Um, we tried to expedite the releases of some of the new products and continue to use our route to market, our distribution relationships to get those wines more effectively uh, entrenched in the marketplace. We also got into making cigars that were more dedicated to um, pairing with wine, um, continued to focus on uh, Bell Gloss. I'd say the major difference was we now had some capital to grow some vineyards. So we went out and started looking for land acquisitions, uh, new plantings here and there, um, which we're still undergoing, Santa Rita Hills, Napa Valley, um, Sonoma. So it's, it's been a great opportunity for us to really bolster um, our, our, our land and be able to sustain the growth of our brands. We got involved in Oregon back in 2011 and uh, started focusing a little more in 12 and then 13. Uh, but I wanted to get uh, acquainted with Oregon Pinot Noir. Felt like we had uh, done well with California Pinot Noir, understood the terroir, how to make the wines. And I originally began looking up here in 2005. Um, didn't make any moves, started having kids, decided moving up here was difficult for the family, so I'd stay down in California. Well, the opportunity came about and, and really wanted to, to start looking up here. I saw that, you know, grapes were great, winemaking was great, but it just didn't quite have the cachet in the marketplace. I think what happened in Oregon was that you had a lot of people that were focusing on a very granular element of winemaking or grape growing. So very small areas, very vineyard designated, very high price points, but you didn't have something on a broader scale. You weren't able to expose it to a broader audience, both from a price point and availability standpoint. Um, and so I felt that if we could come up here and take that approach, of course, with you know being able to create some of those halo wines, some that showcased these beautiful regions and appellations of Oregon, but then also have something on a broader scale, um, sourcing from different regions in the coastlands of California that we'd be able to grow the Oregon Pinot Noir category as well. Been doubling in growth, which is which is great. Uh, still focusing again with uh, restaurants on premise. It's really been growing well in the by the glass. It's our biggest advertising spend as I consider it. We spend more in the reduction of our FOB on by the glass placements than any other marketing that we do. It takes a lot of patience. It takes dollars at the end of the day as well, um, but it's well worth it. And, uh, and so we're taking that same philosophy that we did with Maomi and applying it to Oregon and really trying to capture an audience out there and expose them to Oregon. If you look at California, how California started, it was California grapes. We do a great job growing grapes and we can make some really great wines out of these. Then it went down to, you know, North Coast and then you get down to Napa Valley and then down to Oakville. Well, it was the opposite here in Oregon where it went from, you know, the sub Appalachians of Willamette Valley and then kind of capped out at Willamette Valley. Nobody's really talking about Oregon as a whole. Globally, everybody knows California. Globally, not everybody knows Oregon. There's a lot of work to be done there, and, and we intend to try to enlighten people on what Oregon has to offer. We've been working on a project in uh, Sebastopol area at the Dairyman Vineyard, and it's a winery and distillery. And uh, we've had some uphill battles there, being able to get the approvals for the permit and being able to build there, but it'll happen in time. Um, but wanted to start experimenting with distilled spirits. Started making apple brandy, so we're purchasing fruit from multiple areas, um, pressing it in our wine presses, fermenting it with champagne yeast, and then putting it in the distillery and then aging it. So our oldest brandies now are about four to five years. It's been a whole new uh, sort of uh, you know eye-opening experience there. And a lot of what we know about oak use in wine, which I think we've been very, I'd say, unique in how we use our barrels has translated greatly over to spirits and the spirits that are that are going to be coming out in the next 12 to 18 months um, I think are going to be very unique in style because of our experience with barrels and oak and wine. The initial reason for getting into spirits um, was that apple brandy piece and and part of that correlated to the facility we wanted to build in Sonoma County. 
um, I wanted to take the agricultural history of Sonoma and incorporate it into one um, location. So the ag history there, you have dairy, of course. Um, so I wanted to do a small creamery on site, and then of course wine and grapes. Um, so I wanted to have all of that included into one facility, give a home to some of these heirloom orchards uh, that would you know, translate into a beautiful distilled spirit. So we got into uh, apparel via swimsuits and the brand we call Mia Marcel. And, and that was an opportunity that I saw with getting our wines and spirits and cigars exposed to a different audience. If you look at social media and how um, the followers there, there's a huge base of followers when it comes to cosmetics and apparel. You don't have that volume of followers with spirits, wine, beer. And so if we could get, you know, some of our brands and, and, and people more acquainted with wines and spirits um, that are in that sort of area of, the, you know, of, of interest, then I think we're doing something good for the business. When we looked at how the future looks, say the next 20, 30 years, one of my thoughts was I've got six kids of my own. I want to make sure that they're able to get involved in the business and not have this generational overlap. Where I think a lot of that's, that's, that's where a lot of the infighting comes in. Creating Copper Cane was not just an opportunity for us to grow, but it was also succession planning and being able to sustain our family in the wine business in the long term. When it comes to my kids getting involved in the business, if they want to get involved in the business, I'm absolutely going to take a similar route. I want them to learn from the ground up, be a part of something that they create in their own right, and you know, live on the successes and failures that they provide themselves, and that's the best way to learn. I love the excitement of growing. I love the excitement of experiencing new places, learning about uh, new things, and you know, continuing to expand. Not necessarily so much on a you know on a scale standpoint, but really learning about these regions. I think the best way to learn about how special this industry is is by going somewhere else and doing another job. Once you realize how fantastic this industry is, from ag, industrial, artistic elements to sales and marketing, it's a very special business. I'm fortunate to be in it. I want my kids to be involved in it. And, uh, and that's really what keeps me going. I think there's always room for people to get involved in the wine business, no matter what the scale. Um, there's stories of people that started in the restaurant business. They're servers and they start making wine on the side and they grow it up to be you know, one of the strongest brands in the nation. The best way I'd describe it is, if you have a belief in something and you feel that it's something that's marketable, meaning you're not so philosophically tied to what it is you wanna do, but understand what the marketplace wants, then you have an opportunity. You're always gonna see brands evolve and grow. They're gonna become retail dominant or they're just gonna fall by the wayside, drop their price point, kinda of lose the cachet. And that's gonna create opportunities for the young or, or you know, kind of newcomers into the business to try out their hand in it. Whether it's new styles of wine, new varietals of wine, um, new packaging in wine. I mean, there's a whole lot going on right now in this business and there's a whole lot of opportunity. And nobody knows which way the right way is, but somebody's gonna find it. Somebody's gonna make a couple hundred million dollars on it.